Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. We're glad you joined us today. Please stand. We're going to sing a few songs this morning. I want to read Psalm uh, 71, 22 and uh, down to verse 24. The Bible says this, I will praise thee with the psaltery. Even thy truth, O my God, unto thee will I sing with the harp. O thou Holy One of Israel, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee and my soul which thou hast redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long. Let's sing out, since I have been redeemed, I have a song I love to sing. We'll sing three verses of this, and then we'll sing Standing on the Promises. I have a song I love to sing, since I have been redeemed. Of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number he calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might for that he is strong in power not one faileth sing out with us how great is our God the splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries. 
this uh, beautiful but warm Sunday morning, and it's great to live in New England, isn't it? Last week we had to have the heat on, this week nice and cool in here. I like that new air conditioner, it does a good job. Let's look to the Lord, we'll ask God's blessing on our service today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your goodness to us, and for your mercy and for your grace, and truly, Lord, you are a great God the one true living God. And we come before you this morning to worship you, not only as we lift up our voices and sing and praise you, we worship you as we listen to the preaching of the word, that our hearts and ears would be open. Be with Pastor Ethan as he preaches this morning. We worship you with our tithes and with our offerings. We worship you, Lord, with all that we do. Be with those who are watching on the live stream this morning. We pray that you would bless them as they have tuned into the service. Those that are traveling, be with them. Uh, Those that might be at work this morning, help them to sense your presence at the workplace. But bless the service today in a great way. Let it bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray all of these things. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. It's good. It's good to see everybody today. I want to just make a make you aware of a few things that are coming up, and um, I am also just want to add my thanksgiving for that air conditioning this morning. It feels good in here. That is part of our ongoing church renovation project, and if you have had a part in giving to that, we want to thank you very much. Uh, we've still got some things coming up. We've uh, the chairs are very very close to arriving. I think within about a month, we'll have all brand new beautiful seating in here. 
Um, and there's some more things we want to do. So if you've been able to give toward that, thank you so much. If not, um, there is the opportunity to give toward the Next Step offering. So far, we've brought in $1,500, which has been awesome. And uh, we need to, our goal to complete everything we'd like to complete is about $10,000. So if the Lord has impressed your heart to be a part of this, I'd encourage you to uh, to make that gift and seek the Lord's will on that. But we've got some exciting things happening this summer, and I'm thankful for a church that's, will, that's uh, looking for God's opportunity to move forward. Amen? And we, went, we made a big step forward this morning um, when the bus rolled out of this church at about 9 o'clock this morning. And it's the first time in probably 15 months that we've run our church bus. And we had a great group of people come out yesterday. We canvassed a neighborhood. And this morning, we have five brand new bus riders who came to church this Sunday morning. So we give God the glory. Amen, church? Oh, okay, about half of us there excited about that. So do you believe God wants to use this church to reach this community? Can you say amen? Amen. And I want to thank everybody that's got that vision, that's a part of it. And uh, we, God's got a lot of work for us to do. And I want to encourage you to find a place of service, find a place of involvement. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're here too. And when you are ready, we would love to invite you to come back in the building and worship with us. We are having some great Sundays and we want you to come be a part of it as well. Um, so let's not miss out on what God's got for us. Something that's in the bulletin, or a couple things in the bulletin, we'll have another bus ministry outreach next Saturday. So if you can come out for nine, I think we were done by 10.10 yesterday. Just about a little over an hour to uh, do over 100 homes and see new bus riders come. So if you can come out and help us pass out flyers, that's going to be next Saturday at nine o'clock. It's a great thing for the family. I was out with all my kids, and uh, except for one. <laughs> Where were you? you know, so we had everybody there um, and got to go out and invite people. So you come this Saturday, if you can. We're going to meet at 9 o'clock and uh, we'll go out and do another neighborhood. Um, later on in the month, on June the 27th, that's a Sunday night, we're going to have a bonfire worship service. So you're invited to our home. The details are in the bulletin. We're going to have a great time. 5 p.m. Everything will get started. That's going to be on June the 27th. Um, but be praying about our, the outreach of our church this summer. I know Aaron's got some things in the work for some more kids and teens outreach that we'll be talking about the next few weeks as well. Um, so please be praying about that as we gather on Wednesday nights. We'll make that an important part of our prayer as well. And then something that I've been talking about for a couple of weeks, and everybody should see this on the inside page of your bulletin. I want to talk for a minute about our brand new life groups. So if we could just take a minute and talk about life groups, what they are. We're, we said that we're going to launch them this summer. And listen, have you found this to be true? That the world around us, whether it's at work or school or wherever we are, the world around us isn't particularly interested in encouraging us in our Christian growth. Have you found that to be true? And so God's given us the church, this opportunity to build into each other, and we are adding life groups to support that. So this is an opportunity for us to grow as a church outside the walls of the building. So like I said last week, we're going to have different Wednesday night, I mean Sunday night events where we get the whole church together, just like the bonfire worship service that's coming up in June. But once a month, we are going to have life groups that meet. It's an opportunity to build each other and up in our walk with God. They're going to meet just once per month. And these will be informal gatherings. So they will meet at people's homes. If you, in fact, if you look at this list of groups and you say, yeah, I already had somebody last week tell me right after the service, they said, hey, when you start those pods or whatever they're called, they said, would, uh, we would be willing to host one group at, uh, at our home. And I said, hey, that's awesome. I've already had some other people uh, volunteer to do the same thing. And so they'll move. They'll move around. And so we're trying to find a group for everybody. You see a big list of, of groups there. Now, the goal isn't for you to join every single group. And part of what we want to do with our new schedule is give everybody time on our Sunday evenings, time with family, time to develop friendships, things like that. But we also are using these Sunday nights for these groups. So... We would say, um, join one group that's like, that's my main group. That's the group that I'm going to be a part of on a regular basis. 
at the most, maybe two groups. For instance, I'm going to be in, I'm going to, I plan to be in the family life group because I've got young children and I want to focus on how we raise these young children up for the Lord. But then I'll probably also go to the men's group. So that's kind of the idea to have one, maybe at the most two groups that you're a part of and commit to it, be a regular part. It's not an opportunity to just, it's not something where we just sit and listen to a lesson. It's an opportunity to engage, to enjoy one another's company, the, like in the family life group, we're going to have kids there. It's going to be, it'll probably be the wildest West group out there. So it'll, it'll be a little bit like that, informal. And, um, oh, the young adult group. <laughs> I, I forgot about that one. So uh, they, they meet, well, they've been meeting once a month, or actually twice a month for quite a few months now, um, which has been awesome. But there's something, we'll have a group for couples. We've got a young women's group that has met already. Men's group. Women's group, wherever you fit in, we'd encourage you to find your place, get involved this summer. Again, the point is we'll have certain groups where we are focused on different life stages, where people that are going through similar experiences in life can study the Bible together in a way that's relevant to that. But then we'll have other times where all the groups come together and we have like a bonfire worship service, things like that. If you've got any questions about that, you feel free to ask me. We're going to have more details as far as launch dates, the, uh, a full schedule of this. Hopefully by next week, we'll have that all hammered out. And also different folks that have, uh, are willing to help us lead these groups will be part of uh, as we build this. So we're going to take the summer. Everything's not going to happen all at once, but over the course of the summer, we'll add to this and, and build and just follow the Lord's leading. Uh, so again, I encourage you to get involved, be a part as we get more information out there. All right. So pray about it and get involved. And then take some time at some point to follow up with our missions moment. Uh, got, we're going to start doing this, putting announcements from the mission field in on a regular basis. This should remind us that we've got all of our missions letters in the back. Uh, pray for our missionaries and um, we'll be putting this in every week. All right, well, what we need to do now is ask the Lord to bless our offering today. So, Aaron, I'm going to ask you if you would do that. Lead us in prayer for the offering and then lead us in our next song. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you <clears throat> so much for this opportunity. We thank you for our church. We thank you that we're able to gather together to hear from your word, to worship and praise you. We do pray that, Lord, you would bless our tithes and our offerings as we give back a portion of what you've given to us and blessed us with. We pray that we would use uh, the money wisely here um, as, Lord, we, uh, we advance the gospel here in North Adams and in our, in our, in our local areas. We pray that you be with the missionaries as well uh, across the world as they are ministering to those who have never heard you uh, of you or don't know you as their Savior. We pray that you would bless the money that they receive as well, that it would be used wisely and that it would further the gospel across the world. Bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing, It Was Finished Upon That Cross. We introduced this a couple of weeks ago, um, so it's going to be new to most of us. How I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He declares his work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. Though the sun that sees the shining, though the Lord appeared as lost, Christ has triumphed over evil. It was finished upon that cross. Was once my great opponent. 
moment, fear what's had a hold on me, but the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. chapter number two. I'd like to speak to you today about this topic or ask this question, and you'll see it as we study the passage. The question is this, whose kingdom is this? Whose kingdom is this? We've been studying the life of David, and in 2 Samuel chapter two, we are in the third major part of David's life. And the theme has been following the shepherd. We've watched David as he grows in his faith. And now God is preparing the once shepherd boy to giant killer, to mighty warrior, to then enemy of Saul. And now the stage is set for David to become the king. And that's where we uh, were last week. That's what we were looking at last week. So look with me at 2 Samuel chapter number 2. And I'd like you to look at verse 8. Now I want to warn you. Are you ready to be warned this morning? Okay. There's going to be some strange things in this story that we read today. There's going to be some intense scenes. There's going to be some sword play. And there's going to be some some pursuit. And this passage kind of reads like an action thriller right now. And so I want you to stay with me. And we're going to kind of follow along in the story and see what happens. But think about this whole theme of David becoming the king. Here we go. Verse number 8, 2 Samuel 2. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host. Now remember, Saul is dead. He was the king who didn't want David to be king. Saul was the one who was opposed to David. But now he's out of the way, and David should become the king. But King Saul still has a loyal follower who was the general named, what's his name? I'm going to keep you engaged if I can this morning. So his name is, what is his name? Abner. Abner Abner is loyal to Saul and he sees an opportunity to stay in power. So it says that he took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Maenaim and made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites. Wait a minute. Who's supposed to be the king now? David's supposed to be the king. But Abner says, I don't want that to happen. I want who to be the king? I had one brave person to give that one name. Who did he want to be the king instead? Oh, I've got a few more brave people. He wanted Ishbosheth to be the king instead. So we're going to see these competing kingdoms that are set up. Now, It says in verse 9 that he made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. 
And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So you've got the idea. The land of Israel is separated into sections. The certain tribes controlled the north, and they were loyal to Ishbosheth, who is being controlled by Abner. And then in the south, there's the tribe of Judah. That's David's tribe. That's his family. These are his people. And the tribe of Judah says, David, you're the rightful king. And then up north, they say, nope, we won't follow David. We're sticking with Saul's son, Ishbosheth and Abner. Now, new characters come in. It says in verse number 12, and Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And now, verse number 13, a new character is introduced. We've seen him before, but now we focus on him in this chapter. Verse 13, and Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And you have a Wild West showdown on either side of this Judean pool. Now, it's not a pool like a swimming pool. I think most of us know that. It's like a pond or a small lake. And they've got a showdown. On the one side of the water is all the people who are loyal to David, the men of Judah. And the men of Judah on the one side, and they're just looking across the water at the men from the north, the men that are under Abner, the men who are loyal to Saul. What is going to happen next? Well, we're about to see. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll ask God to bless our scripture reading and our message today. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to read the Bible. And I pray that you'd help us this morning to see the truths that apply to us. Lord, you've given your word for it to change our lives. And I need your help as I preach today. And we as a church need your help as we listen. So we ask it, uh, we ask for your presence and your leading this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Joab, Abner, and David. Joab is loyal to David. Abner is opposed. But what you're going to see in the rest of our reading this morning is this. These two men are not primarily focused on the rightful kingdom. These two men are focused on, who do you think? Themselves. These two men are completely self-obsessed. These are your classic political operatives. They have military power, they have loyal followings, and they are people that are obsessed with control, power, and domination. And then you have the rightful chosen king, King David. It's an interesting development that will unfold. Now, I want you a couple of things. You'll notice in your introduction, if you're looking at your notes this morning, you'll see this in the introduction. The groundwork for David's kingdom is being laid. His throne is being established as God promised. But I'm going to mention this. It's important for us as students of the Bible to understand that when we look at David's kingdom, it's not just about David. And it's not just about that little nation of Israel right there. Because David's kingdom and the, this inauguration of the kingdom of David actually is very significant, but it points to an eternal kingdom. A kingdom that you and I will actually be a part of, or even now are a part of. So as you look at David's kingdom, and we see the story and everything unfold, don't miss the fact that this is all heading somewhere historically. It's all heading somewhere prophetically. In the passage today, Abner and Joab seem to forget who the true king is. I thought about, I was thinking about what's a good illustration of people who forget their place. Do you ever, you ever meet somebody that seems to have forgotten their place? Do you know what I mean by that? And the classic was, I remember this scenario years ago um, about uh, a young woman that was getting ready to, be, to get married. How many of you know the, how many of you have experienced a bridesmaid who really wants to be the star of the show that day? Who knows what I'm talking about? You, you, nobody? Is some of you with me? You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about there? And so I uh, got to position themselves in the pictures. 
And so the story I heard of this, this one bridesmaid, um, as the bride picked the colors for the wedding, the bride picked the colors for the wedding, and I think the colors were pink. And the bridesmaid immediately, the future bridesmaid immediately replied, well, that's not going to work because pink's not a good color on me. And then as they went shopping for the, 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 um, the wedding gown, do you know what the bridesmaid would do during that moment? Oh, let me try this one on. <laughs> let me try that one on. She forgot her place, that she was not the bride. She was the bride's maid. And all through life, people forget their place, both in life, but also in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God. You see, Joab and Abner, they don't realize or they forget that they are not the king. Who is the king? David is the king. But they become obsessed with their agenda, their power, and what they desire. You and I as Christians, we must constantly evaluate our lives. We must examine our motives. And we've got to ask ourselves the question, whose kingdom are we serving? Whose work are we invested in? Now, a few things here. Let's get back to the text. You noticed in the verses that we read in verses 8 down through verse 11, um, you can find in verse number 11, if you look down at verse 11, the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And then we had already seen that Ishbosheth, back in verse 10, Ishbosheth reigned in Israel. There's something that nobody realized. I'm not even sure David realized it at this moment. As it, it, it doesn't look particularly promising for David. In fact, he is outnumbered. There are more people that are following the opposing kingdom than are following David's kingdom. But I'd like to give you this point here this morning, and that is this. I don't even know if David realized it, but David's kingdom was an unstoppable kingdom. David's kingdom was an unstoppable kingdom. It did not matter. It did not matter that there were fewer people loyal to David than there were uh, to Ishbosheth. Didn't matter. Now, if you looked at it from a human perspective and you were deciding who you were going to throw in with, who might you have decided to go with? Well, if you didn't know any better, you might throw in with the majority. You might throw in with the crowd. You might throw in with the people that were all heading in the same direction. You're certainly not going to take your chances with an underdog. But what they didn't realize was David's kingdom was unstoppable. Because, ultimately, David's kingdom is not about him. God's plan was greater than David. God's plan in eternity was to bring to bring about the Messiah through the line of David. His plan was to bring the Messiah through the line of David. So no matter what happened, no matter how the odds were stacked, no matter what was up against David, nothing was going to stop this. In fact, I gave you the scripture, which we, we need to put some scriptures together this morning, and that is Luke 1, verse 30 and 33. This is actually the Christmas story. I want you to see this from the, what we think of as the Christmas story in Luke 1 and verse 30 down through 33. The angel said to Mary, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, who? David. See, as a student of the Bible, you've got to understand that it, though we're talking about David, we're really talking about the kingdom of Jesus that would be established. You notice how the passage finishes that the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for how long? Forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. The kingdom of David is the kingdom of Jesus. And listen, I've got news for you this morning. The kingdom of Jesus is unstoppable. 
And you and I, we are a part. If we are believers in Christ, we are the, a part of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an eternal kingdom. It's an unstoppable kingdom. And just like in the time of David, just like in the time of David when it looked like David's outnumbered, it looked to David like, like boy, there's more people on the opposing side than there are on my side. David, I've got news for you. You may not realize it. It may not look like it, but your kingdom is an unstoppable kingdom. There could be a million people opposed to it, but your kingdom will move forward because your kingdom is not about you, David. It's about Jesus. Your kingdom is about eternity. And friends, Christians, we listen, we live in a generation where it feels like the world, the majority is going against us. Am I the only one that feels like that? Are you with me this morning? Does it feel sometimes you can say amen? Help me out today. Amen. amen? So does it feel sometimes like the world is, is just, the majority is going the opposite way? Listen, we are a part of an eternal kingdom. And just as it was unstoppable in David's day, it's unstoppable today. So it's not a time to run and retreat. It's a time to stand fast for the kingdom of our Lord. Now, David's kingdom is eternal. Our kingdom is eternal. And now all of these battles, the next thing you're going to see is this, and that really brings us to this next point. What we've already seen are kingdoms in conflict. Kingdoms in conflict. I think you've got the analogy already. Just like we are a part of God's eternal kingdom, if we're believers, there is a kingdom of this world. There is a kingdom of this world. Now, in the book of Ephesians, in chapter number 6, the Bible says this, We wrestle... Not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And verse number 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to what? To stand. To stand. It's a time for people to realize that there are opposing kingdoms. There is the kingdom of of the Lord, and there's the kingdom of this world. The first question you have to ask yourself is, which kingdom do you belong to? Which kingdom are you a part of? Now, hopefully, you're a believer in Christ, and you can say confidently, I am part of his kingdom. Well, these two kingdoms find themselves in conflict. Look at what happens next in the story. Look at verse number 12. And Abner, the son of Ner, oh, we already read this. Let's go down to verse, remember, we left at the pool, right? So that was verse 13. At the end of verse 13, it says this, one was on one side of the pool and the other was on the other side of the pool. Cue the Clint Eastwood music or whatever right now, because here it comes. They're looking at each other across the pool. And now this strange thing happens. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Then there arose and went over by number 12 of Benjamin, which pertaineth to Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. Wherefore that place was called Helkath Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. And there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. So these guys, I mean, show down around the pool, and they say, you send your twelve, you send your twelve. And Joab and Abner just sit back and they watch this thing. The strangest thing happens is each guy, they just quickly grab a hold of the other guy. They grab their sword and simultaneously, Puh! they're all dead. That's a very unceremonious way to begin a battle. But so it begins. And as soon as that happens, the opposing armies rise up and they just clash. And really an epic battle scene that day. And they fight against each other. Well, as you've been watching or reading, how is the story unfolding? The men of the kingdom of David, the men under Joab and David's kingdom, they're winning the battle. It's going well. And Abner, though he has all of, the, all of the rest of Israel behind him, they are losing the battle. It's not going well for them. So they begin to run. And they, they're on the run. It says in verse number, verse number 18, there were three sons of Zeruiah there. 
Joab, and Abishai, and Asahel. And Asahel was light, as light of foot as a wild roe. Do you see that in verse number 18? This is Joab's little brother. Joab's got two brothers, Abishai and Asahel. Now, Asahel's got a reputation. He is fast. He's quick. He runs like a deer. And that's just what he's known for. And so what happens is the men of Israel under Abner, they take off. Asahel sees this happen. And you know what he does? He says, I'm going to catch you. I'm going to run you down. I'm going to catch you. And I'm going to kill you, Abner. And here it goes. It says in verse number 19, and Asahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand, nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to the right hand or to the left. Lay thee hold on one of the young men. Take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following of him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? See, these guys knew each other. They'd, they'd known each, they were men of power in this civil, this is a civil war. They know each other. And Abner, he says, he looks at this kid. I mean, just imagine this older, older general type. He can't outrun this kid. He knows it. I mean, he's got a head start, but there's no way he's going to, in, in the long run, outrun this young guy, Asahel. And Asahel's just like, I'm not going that way. I'm not going that way. I am hunting you down, Abner. And Abner stops and he says, hey, man, lay off. That's my interpretation of how he says it. But he says, hey man, back off. Why don't you go take that, go fight against that guy or go fight against that guy. Go take somebody else's armor. After all, boy, I don't want to have to kill you. And he's like, no way. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. And so he pursues again. Abner turns around again. He says, hey, I got to show my face to your brother Joab. If I kill you, how am I ever going to look at him? And Asahel is young. He's cocky, he's arrogant, and he's going to come back with Joab's head. He's determined, he's going to defeat this, this general, and he's going to make a name for himself. Verse 23, Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner, with the hinder part of the spear, smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there, and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died stood still. Joab also and Abishai, the other brother, pursued after Abner. And the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Amma that lieth before Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on the top of an hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? Abner basically says, Listen, enough people have died. Can we just call this thing quits today? How many more men have to die? Interesting perspective when you're on the losing end of things, wouldn't you say? But Abner says, How, This shouldn't keep going on. Let's end it. Asahel's been killed. And Joab says in verse 27, As God liveth, unless thou hast spoken, surely then in the morning the people had gone up every one from following his brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through all Bithron. And they came to Mahanaim. And Joab returned from following Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants 19 men in Asahel. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that 303 score men died. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at break of day. So this battle, these kingdoms in conflict, it ends with a bittersweet victory. Nothing is going to stop the kingdom of David. 
But there was a casualty along the way, and that's Asahel. So as the story ends, Joab, I imagine the older brother, carrying the body of his youngest brother, laying it down with all the soldiers gathered round. As they count their dead, they count their wounded, and they bury Asahel that evening. And that will not be the end of the Joab, Abner, and Asahel story. There will be more. This scene of a spear in his brother and the burying of his brother in the ground, this scene will stay in the mind of Joab and will play over and over and over again. He will not let this go. He will not let it go. Now, verse 1 of the following chapter, there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were sons born in Hebron. And so we get a little glimpse into David's life in verses 2, verse number 3, 4, verse number 5. It talks about these were born to David in Hebron. But again, back to verse number six, and another interesting episode. It came to pass, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made what? Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. Joab and Abner, powerful men. Abner now, they've consolidated their power in the north, David is in the south. There's battles going on. In the meantime, who is, who is acquiring power? Abner, Abner, Abner. Joab will start to do the same thing. But listen, what the king needs, what the kingdom does not need is selfishness. What the king needs is service. Abner is not a servant. Abner is somebody who is all in it for himself. Let's read what he does and be, avoid the, the selfish tendencies of Abner. It says that he made himself strong for the house of Saul. Now look at verse 7. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Again, I told you there's going to be some strange readings in this account. These are the the customs of the day. Unfortunately, sometimes God's people were supposed to be behaving God's way, were behaving more like pagan nations around them. So these kings and these powerful people, they took many wives and they had concubines and they pleased themselves in, in such ungodly ways. And, and Abner, as he takes power, there was a concubine who was, who was Saul's and Abner has a relationship with this concubine. Why? Because he feels entitled. He feels that he has the power. He has the right. Boy, we may not live in an ancient land like that, but we see this kind of exploitation with powerful men even today, do we not? It's all around us. I know that we don't embrace all of the movements of our culture and that they have their excesses, but the whole Me Too movement that we experienced a few years ago, some of that definitely needed to happen because of all of the terrible exploitation. But this has been a pattern of wicked, selfish hearts from the very beginning of time. And for his own benefit and his own selfishness, Abner uses this concubine in an ungodly way. But Ishbosheth isn't really concerned about the concubine, the, the young woman. Who is Ishbosheth now concerned about? Himself. Well, you didn't have a right to do that. Now, Abner is not, he doesn't care. He, Abner does not really care who the king is. Abner doesn't care who the king is so long as it serves his purposes. So look what he does. Look what he does. It says that Ishbosheth challenges him in verse number eight. Abner was very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth. And he says, Who do you think I am? Am I a dog's head? 
which against Judah do show kindness this day to the house of Saul thy father, to his brethren, to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? Abner says, do you realize what I've done for you? Do you realize everything that I have offered? Do you realize all of the, uh, all of the, the, the good things that I've done for you, Ishbosheth? Me, 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 me. I have done this. I have accomplished. It's because of me that David's not even the king. He's got this very inflated view of himself. Whose kingdom is this? That's the question as I read it. I'm trying to, you know, there's so many themes, but I'm trying to come away with one simple theme. And I just keep thinking, Joab, Abner, whose kingdom is this? Is this really about the house of Saul and David or is it about you guys and your power and your will? So Abner says this, it's over, man. Ishbosheth, I'm done with you. I am done with you. He says in verse 9, So do God to Abner, and more also, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him. Isn't that interesting in verse number 9? Abner knew that God wanted David to be king. But Abner didn't care about that until now that it serves his purpose. Verse 10, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. He said, Ishbosheth, I tell you what I'll do. You don't like this. How about I do this? How about I give your little kingdom to David who's supposed to have it anyway? Boy, so Ishbosheth backs off. But Abner carries out the plan. In verse 12, Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee, to bring about all Israel unto thee. And he said, Well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. And David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife, Michael, which I espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Phaltiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her, along weeping behind her, to Bahurim. Then said Abner unto him, Go return. And he returned. More strange happenings in the story. <laughs> Can't unpack every bit of this today. The idea is this. Abner says, Ishbosheth, it's over. The kingdom's going to David. Abner goes to David and says, let's make peace. Ishbosheth wants to save his own skin, so he says, all right, I'd rather not die if David wants to be king, okay. So David says, fine, we can reconcile this kingdom, but you need to return my wife to me that Saul had taken. So they do it. That's what happens. Now, they set up a ceremony. I'll skip over some of this for sake of time. Verse 17, Abner gathers all of the elders together. And he says that God promised David the kingdom. We're going to put this together. Verse 19, he gets the leaders of Benjamin. Verse 20, they all come to Hebron for this conference to unite the kingdom. In verse 21, Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel unto my Lord the king, that they make a league with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. So what has taken place is the treaty has been made. The conference has happened. They've said, all right, let's let the war be over. We will put these two kingdoms together. But do you know who was missing from the conference? Who have we not heard from recently? Joab. Joab has been left out of these delegations, of the delegation. Joab has been left out of the negotiation. Now, knowing Joab, how do you think he feels about that? Well, here we go. Behold, verse 22, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop. They were, they were in battle. And they brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the hosts that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner came, and he's gone in peace. 
that Joab just loses it now. In verse 24, he is ticked off. Verse 24, then Joab came to the king and said, what hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away? Verse 25, thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner. He came to deceive thee and to know thy going out and thy coming in, to know everything you do. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner. What Abner was doing now, we see Joab doing. Are you following the story? Peace has been brokered. There's supposed to be peace. Joab gets back. He is not happy with the peace. Can I ask this question? What does that matter? Shouldn't matter at all. Why? Because Joab is not the king. Abner is not the king. Joab is not the king. David is the king. Neither of these men serve at the pleasure of the king. They serve for themselves. And so he finds out and he says, send word. I, need to, I want to have a meeting with Abner. I'm going to take this into my hands. Set up a meeting with me and Abner. So it says in verse 27 that they brought him again from the well of Sirah, but David knew it not. Abner was returned to Hebron. Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly. He says, Abner, come here. We need to have a conversation, buddy. And I see Abner. Abner's just like, you know, he assumes that David must have sent Joab. Uh, uh, what else would he think? But remember the scene that's playing through the mind of Joab. What scene did I remind us of earlier? What scene is playing through the mind of Joab? The death of his little brother, Asahel. And as Joab remembers, Abner somehow, how foolish can you get? But his pride has lifted him up. He comes to meet Joab and Joab remembers the body of his brother and Abner's spear in him. Joab. Come here, old friend. Let's talk about this peace treaty. Who knows what their conversation, how it started. Maybe, you know, you'll control this part. I'll control that part. But come on over here. And I see Abner with one hand. I mean, I see Joab with one hand. Put around Abner. And as they come in for close conversation, he takes his other hand with the dagger and he thrusts it into Abner. And Abner drops dead at the feet of Joab. And Joab, I hear him say, that was for Asahel. And Abner dies that day. Just a little bit of humor here. In my, you, you, you guys, uh, I, I type a lot of things out on my phone, you know, my notes. I'm typing Joab. You know, how many of you love autocorrect, how that works? You know what I'm saying? So on my phone, Joab turns into Joan. The story reads a little bit differently with Joan, you know, right there. But anyhow, uh, just thought I'd give you that for free this morning. Abner dies. He dies, it says at the end, for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Verse 28, David hears about this. Now, who has to deal with the fallout of this? Does Joab have to deal with this? Nope. All of this is now whose problem? David's problem. Because it's David's kingdom. It all belongs to him. When David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. This was not my plan. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all his father's house. Let this, let them receive it. If somebody's going to take vengeance, don't be on my kingdom. This is on Joab. This is completely on him. He acted on his own. But enough blood has been shed. So David takes no action against Joab. David's, I, I see David at this point. Enough blood has been shed. I simply want peace. I desire reconciliation. Verse 31, David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David himself followed the bier. At the funeral procession, David is behind him and David gives a eulogy. They buried Abner. 
the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. And when all the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day, David sware, saying, So do God to me, and more also, if I taste bread or aught else till the sun be down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people in all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to slay Abner the son of Ner. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And am I this day weak, though anointed king? And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. The king, David, desires his kingdom to be reconciled. His number one desire is that there be a reconciliation of the kingdom. Was that Joab's desire? Joab doesn't care about the reconciliation. That's not his chief objective. Joab is concerned with what he wants and his vengeance and his righteousness and him being made to be right. That's everything that he's concerned with. But the king wants reconciliation. I, I could not help but be struck as we know that David's kingdom speaks of a greater and truer kingdom. Our king Jesus, above all else, desires the reconciliation of his people. I mean, the number, Jesus' kingdom is not a kingdom of vengeance. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of reconciliation. But you know something? I have found in my life and in the life of many followers of the king that sometimes, rather than us mirroring the heart and the desires of our king, we go about to establish our own little kingdom within his. Does that make sense? Does anybody else find, ever find yourself there? That, that Jesus said, in fact, it's not new to 21st century Christians. There's probably one of the most famous disciples of all was a man named Simon Peter. And when they came to, when they came to take Jesus, when they came for the king, what was Simon Peter's first reaction? Where did his hand go? To his sword. You see, the heart of Peter was a heart of Joab. You take my king, you stand up against us. This is, we are, we are part of the true kingdom. We are right. Who are you, you Romans? Who are you, you Sanhedrin? You're against Jesus. You're against the king. David takes his hand. I mean, uh, I'm getting all my people confused, right? Peter takes his hand. He goes for the sword. And in Joab's spirit, what does he do? In the spirit of Abner and the spirit of Joab before him, he reaches out and slices off the ear of that soldier. And Jesus says what? Put away your sword. Put away your sword. You're going to live by the sword. You will also die by the sword. I found, do you remember at the beginning, I talked about the fact that we are in conflicting kingdoms? That we're in conflicting kingdoms? We understand that the system of this world is against us. We, we understand that, right? But what is God's desire? What is the desire of the king? To bring reconciliation. But I've noticed that Christians in our generation are often more concerned with wielding the sword of Joab. We want everybody to know how right we are. We want everybody to know that what politicians they should really be voting for. We want everybody to know that, that our rights should not be taken away. You don't take away my rights. Listen, I believe all of that stuff, okay? I believe it all. You can, you can check me out, interrogate me anytime you want. I'm as conservative as the day is long. But the truth is this, the kingdom, Jesus said, and I put the scripture on your passage, Jesus answered Pilate and he says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants what? Fight. Boy, we need to watch out for the spirit of Joab 
and the spirit of Abner rising up within us. It's concerning. It really is concerning that, that there are Christians who are more concerned with, with fighting the culture than investing in someone's life for the purpose of reconciliation. Are we more concerned with fighting a culture war or advancing the gospel? I'm not delegitimizing anything that we engage in, right? If you need to speak up about this or that, that is fine. But the question is this, with what spirit do you have? Joab was supposed to be a servant of David. He did not have the spirit of King David. He had his own spirit. Christians, in our lives, with what spirit? Whose kingdom is it anyway? It's not our kingdom. It's his kingdom. And he sent us in the world on a rescue mission. Now, we are going to battle along the way. But as we read earlier, we're not battling against flesh and blood. We're battling spiritual forces. I love the song that we sing often. It, um, O Church Arise. And it talks about picking up the sword. It says, and with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with strength and valor. You see... We're called on a, a mission of love. We're called on a mission of reconciliation. We're called to serve the king of kings. Not to build our own kingdom or advance our own desires. We need, to, we need a generation of Christians that are less concerned with, with how the world perceives us. Or less concerned with our status and our position and our rights. And more concerned with advancing the kingdom of Christ. Why? Because the last thing I'll share with you is that our King Jesus is worthy of everything. David was a, a worthy king to follow, wouldn't you agree? But Jesus is such a greater king. And David points to the, great, the greater king and the greater kingdom. Colossians 1 says this, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now look at verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the what? The what? The kingdom of his dear son. Notice first of all in here, there was a translation that took place. Every person is born into this world under the kingdom of darkness. We're lost. We're sinful. We're born in the kingdom of darkness. But I thank God in my life, and you can give testimony in your life, that there was a time when I put my faith in Christ and I was changed. I no longer am a member of the kingdom of darkness, but I belong to the kingdom of the dear Son of God, Jesus Christ. And how did it happen? Verse 14 tells us, in whom we have redemption through what? His blood. See, King David was a good king. He served the people well. But he didn't give his life for his servants. He didn't give his life for them. But our king, King Jesus, gave his very life. He gave it all. Isn't it such a stark difference? Joab, Peter with his sword, in his hand and Jesus standing there before Pilate saying my kingdom is not of this world sometimes the disciples look very different than the master sometimes the servants look very different than the king so I've just got to ask these application questions at the end Christians believers Whose kingdom have you been serving? Are you more concerned with your will? Am I more concerned with my desires? I get distracted by all kinds of things in life. And, and it's not just the Joab vengeance thing. It could be building my kingdom. It could be a, a job, a home, a career, a, a possession. It could be something that this is my kingdom. I'm, doing, I'm, I'm in control of this. Whose kingdom are you serving? 
Maybe this morning is an opportunity to realign yourself, to confess once again your allegiance to the true king, the one who died for you. And then for the unbeliever or the one who is uncertain if you've ever trusted Christ as your savior, if you're just not sure which kingdom you're a part of, listen, we're born into this world in the kingdom of darkness. We're controlled by our sin and our desires. But Jesus came to rescue us from that. Jesus shed his blood. Jesus died and he rose again so that we could be saved from the kingdom of this world and belong to his kingdom, a kingdom of forgiveness, and a kingdom of eternal life. Have you ever received that king by faith? Have you ever put your trust and your faith in him alone? And we've come a long way this morning. We've come from an ancient battlefields to a, the cross where Jesus died, but now it comes to the seat that you sit in or the screen that you watch this on today. What about you and your heart? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? And if you have not, would you do that today? Let's all bow our heads, close our eyes as we prepare to finish this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed, and the questions that were asked, have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? If you'd say, I'm not sure, would you make that decision today? You can pray a simple prayer. You can say, Lord, I've lived my life all on my own. And I realize today that I'm lost. But I believe, Jesus, that you died for me. I believe that you rose again. And today I ask you to save me. Today I put my faith in you and you alone. If you'll do that this morning, if you'll make that decision this morning, the Bible says in an instant, it's supernatural, in an instant, you go from lost to saved. You go from being a part of the kingdom of the world to being a, a member of God's kingdom. You go from, from being on your way to hell to on your way to heaven. Not because of anything you do, but all because of what Jesus did. It's all about him and trusting him. Christian, how about you? Have you let the Joab heart creep back into your life? Whose kingdom have you been living under? You know you belong to Jesus, but whose kingdom is this anyway? As the piano plays, let's have just a moment where we can speak to the Lord in prayer. And maybe you need to reset your heart this morning. Maybe you need to refocus your gaze on Christ. time we've had this morning. I thank you for your word. I pray that you'd help us to love you more. Lord, we thank you that you have called us with a holy calling. Help us to live faithful to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand. We'll sing it was finished upon that cross. of Jesus on the cross of Calvary he declares his work is finished he has spoken this hope to me though the sun has ceased its shining though the war appeared has lost Christ has triumphed
translated us into the kingdom of your dear son. And I pray that we would live in that kingdom, that we would live in service to you and not in selfishness. I pray that we would take this message with us as we go, that I, we would allow it to change our, our hearts and our thinking and our lives. Bless us as we leave this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You could also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.